set a, we'll keep the light down, I suppose, uh, because of the slides. Well, if it would help them to see the screen better. Yeah, no, we'll keep it this way. Is that good enough for the screen? I think so. Yeah. Hi, good evening everyone. Um, I'm Gwen Robinson, uh, past president of the FCCT and uh, editor-at-large of Nikkei Asia. And um, welcome this evening uh, for a program which, to me, I think um, all of us who care about Burma or Myanmar, uh, whether it's more about politics or culture and history, but actually, it's, um, it's really great uh, for me to have a program that's not directly about conflict, human rights atrocities, displacement, despair, which of course are th the crucial issues with Myanmar today, but it's, you know, it's something that casts a light on a country that uh, I think you're all here because you're interested in Myanmar. And even though one could argue, actually, that the turmoil we're seeing in Myanmar today, um, the seeds of that, some of it lies in this crucial period of British colonial rule and, you know, what essentially, I think, emerged as an unequal and flawed system uh, that emerged after that, those difficult uh, years. So we're very lucky to have with us tonight author and scholar Sweep, uh, Riti Napakon, or Ake, as we um, know him, who's lectured and written widely on Burmese culture, including on his great passion, Textiles of Myanmar, whilst also all these years collecting these extremely special and some of them very rare photographs. He, only, he not only put together this stunning collection of old photos with meticulous research and care, but he is also a leading authority on Burmese textiles among many other interests. And he's just fresh from a journey to Mandalay, um, which I hope will provide a bit of extra context for his talk tonight. And um, hopefully he'll also compare some historic old images with contemporary equivalents um, that are portraying this diverse social, political and cultural uh, facets of this society reverberating today. So I'm going to hand over to Ake, who's going to take us through the book, but not the entire book. So there's still uh, a compelling reason to buy it. It's uh, on sale here today for a big discount. Uh, normally 1,700 baht, I think. It's 1,500 over there. And you've got the author to sign it. So um, do consider it. It's uh, one of those books, not just for the coffee table. I really enjoyed reading it fascinating glimpses into a, um, a bygone era of Burma. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll leave it there and I might update you later if any of you are interested in other FCCT events coming up, um, but particularly I'll just mention one on Thursday, which is uh, a, with an up-and-coming, extremely interesting young novelist uh, with her debut novel and she is going to come and talk at the club for our book club night on Thursday. So have a look at details of our programs on uh, Facebook or our website. So with that, um, Kuneik, over to you. Thank you so much, Gwen, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here today. I think all of us who are here tonight are Burma file or Burma family, I would say, in in some way, we are connected to Burma or Myanmar, as you would call, or you love the culture, you've been traveling there, you've lived there, or you appreciate everything about this country. So I think we are the same, we are akin in this when it comes to this subject. So I'm very pleased to be here this evening and share with you some of the stories that I'm very much fascinated by this country. Um, I did a few talks already since the beginning of this year, so I would not want to call this a kind of book launch talk anymore. It's a lot more like a book talk or something more that I can extract from the book and share with you what I've found. Today, I'll be showing you some photographs, but more importantly, I would like to juxtapose them with some of the pictures from the present day. So you see that so many things in Myanmar 
hasn't really changed, you know, either 70 years ago or 100 years ago. Everything is still pretty much the same. And perhaps it gives you some ideas to understand the country more of why it is the way it is. And it's not just like the way it is now, 10 years ago, but it was like this 100 years ago. So that's what my talk today would, would be all about. So um, even for me, I, I like the country. I've been studying anything about Myanmar for so many years. I still find something that fascinates me even up until yesterday. I was, or two days ago, I was in Mandalay, so I found some new things that I haven't seen, although I've visited them so many times. But I couldn't help but, but feeling very sorry for the country. You know, I, two months ago, I was in Yangon, and then two days ago, I was in Mandalay. I've stopped going since the COVID time and the coup took place. So I've heard so many stories of my close friends. Some people said it's dangerous, don't go. Some people said it's okay, just come. It's not scary anymore. So in the end, I made up my mind. I need to go and see for myself what the country is up to at the moment. You know, I think in Yangon or even in Mandalay, life goes on. I think local life, you go to the market. It's the same fresh market bustling as it used to be. But in Yangon, you will tell, you can tell right away there's so many mega construction projects that is left halfway finished. Some part of the city with unfinished building look like ghost town, and that's what happened. The Scott market that we used to go shopping and everything, I think now it's only 15% of the shop that still remains open and maybe only a few days a week. And the only expat that they target as customer now are people from the embassy because there's no tourists. In Mandalay, I think you see the, the shops on the main roads and everything kind of, a lot of them closed down, but you see more development from the Chinese businessmen coming in. So that's something that is still kind of give the energy to Mandalay from economic viewpoint. But if you ask the local, I don't think they are so happy with, uh, with a lot of Chinese businessmen coming in so much because they know that these Chinese businessmen are more for money making, something that they can extract from the country, natural resources and so many things. And now I think in Myanmar, they're still under curfew from midnight to four. I was just talking to Gwen right now that even the overnight bus from Mandalay to, Rang to Yangon, they have to stop at midnight somewhere along the route so people can sleep in the bus or outside at the rest point and the journey will begin again at four in the morning. And after nine o'clock now in the evening, hardly anybody wants to go out anymore because they want to stay in. And I think the crime rate has gone quite high. Um, for travelers, they would advise travelers to just be on a busy street. That's where you will be safe. But if you wander around in a quiet street, maybe some robbery, you know, pickpocketing or thief, that's something that is quite common. But again, I'm saying this just to give you an update. Not that I'm, I'm feeling differently about Burma now, you know, comparing to before. Um, I said I learned so many new things about Myanmar every day. We'll just give you one example. I read an article um, a month ago, it was an article I found online by the local scholar. Um, if you know that in, during the 80s, they changed the name of the country from Burma to Myanmar because somehow the rationale of the military was that Burma referred to Burma, which is the only main um, ethnic groups. And it's not the real representation of everyone in Myanmar. But in fact, the new name Myanmar is still the same. It's almost like you call Japan Nippon, or you call Germany Deutschland. It's the same thing. Because, you know, and, and so the argument that was given that why Burma to Myanmar, after reading this article, it was very eye-opening to me that it's not that. When in fact, if you go into the linguistic route, then you know that it's the same thing. Yes. So let's begin with something um, cheerful. I think generally, you've, if you've been to Myanmar, you will know that people are very gracious. They are very hospitable. They are very kind. Especially now, if you go to the countryside, even this time when I was in Mandalay, 
I was purchasing four bags of green tea. And then the, the owner of the shop readily give me another small sachet and say, oh, present, present for you. You know, I went to the monastery. Some of the old lady who were there during the start of the Buddhist land, they spent the night there. They brought out like bananas. They brought out some tea for me to have. It's, they're, they're always welcoming. So I think this is something that is ingrained in the way they are. And you can tell right away, starting from the premieres all the way down to the grassroots level, you can, you can feel this wherever you go in Myanmar. Um, the left photograph was during the 50s, I think in 1955, when Burma was a newly open independent country post-World War II. At that time, there, was, there were quite a few new countries who gained independence, and they formed themselves as a non-ally countries. And they had a conference in Bandung. I think it's Asian African Conference or something, but but the nickname was called a Bandung Conference. And at that conference, um, there's so many premiers from different countries that flew in, and along the way they have to make a stop in Yangon. And this was where the Prime Minister Unu, who was quite instrumental in organizing the, the meeting as well, welcome everyone. The same time when they have the Songkran or the Jan in Myanmar, the New Year. So the prime minister readily engaged this premier into the water <laughs> sprinkling traditions. And you still see now on the right, which is fast forward almost like 60, 70 years ago, Aung San Suu Kyi was still engaged in the activity. I think it was a sense of goodwill and people were happy. It's not a water fight, I would say. You know, it's water sprinkling, you just do it for fun. But now I think it's become more aggressive. But all in all, I think Myanmar people are very pleasant and very lovely. And they are very much like Thai people. That's why when I go to Myanmar, every time I feel pretty much at home. One, two things that I noticed right away that we are very much the same. Myanmar and Thai people are very superstitious. That's one thing I learned right away. And the second thing is um, they have certain... Um, when you, when you meet new people and if you find a good chemistry, you fall in love with them and you fall in love with them forever. But if you find someone and you, and you meet someone new and you don't feel that we have a good chemistry together, sometimes you tend to don't feel comfortable with that person. I think it's, it's, it's a little, I think it's something to do with Southeast Asian culture as well. Maybe not only just Myanmar or Thailand, but maybe in Malaysia, maybe in Indonesia or in Laos. But, but it's a kind of common thread of, of, of our attitude or our ways of, of when we meet people, we always gauge like what kind of chemistry do we have. And that also will underpin whatever interaction that we have in the future. And um, I think Myanmar in 1950s, they started off being a new country. So they tried to reestablish a lot of diplomatic relationship to many countries, including Thailand, which is a very close neighbor. I think when I was growing up in the 80s, I learned so little about Burma in the history of Thailand. And the only bit that I learned was that Myanmar sacked Ayutthaya. And Ayutthaya was burned down by the Burmese troop. And every time I went on a field trip to Ayutthaya, we would look at all the ruin and say, oh, this is what the Burmese troop burned down. And they took all the gold. And now when you look at the Chue De Gong Pagoda, these are all the Siamese gold they took. And this is something that I was imprinted by the history that was taught when I was young. But in fact, after the Second World War, I think Burma was very open. They tried to, to, to reconnect with, with, with Thailand as well. And you see that through a lot of state visits by the premier of both nations. I think the first time was when um, Her Ma Their Majesty King Pumipon, Queen Sirigit, invited Unu, then the prime minister of Burma, to come to Thailand first as a visit. And little was known that Unu actually went to Ayutthaya and he went to perform a ceremony to beg the pardon in Ayutthaya. So every time I tell this story, I would say Thai people, forgive them already. You don't have to retell the story about like burning our go anymore. You know, they already come and beg for our pardon. So, so, so give them peace of mind. But Unu did that. And then later on in the same year, 
อุนุอินไวท์เจเนอเรลแบล็กพิบูลสงครามและเดอะเฟิร์สเลดีท่านผู้หญิงละเอียดทูเพย์วิสิตทูยังกอนและนั่นคือภาพที่ถ่ายทางซ้ายในการประชุมของประธานาธิบดีที่มีการประชุมในห้องประชุมและในปีต่อไปใน1960ในตอนนั้นอุนุยังเป็นผู้ใหญ่ของประธานาธิบดีเนวินเป็นผู้ใหญ่ของประธานาธิบดีในตอนนั้นและประธานาธิบดีเนวินเป็นผู้ใหญ่ของประธานาธิบดี They invited Their Majesty to come to Yangon for a visit, and Their Majesty stayed there for four days. The, the schedule was really packed. You know, His Majesty even visited the mausoleum of General Aung San to pay a visit. They went on on a boat trip on, you know, on along the Rangoon River. I think U Vin Mao, the President, even organized a garden party, which was well well attended, almost a thousand. Um, People attended the party, so it was a grand event at that time. So I would say we have a good relationship, you know, with Myanmar up until now. The right photo that was from 2016 when Do Aung San Suu Kyi visiting um, Bangkok. I think she was there to discuss about um, labor cooperation between Thailand and Myanmar, and I'll discuss about the Davao, Davao special economic zone. So I don't know. How is everything going at the moment under the t a t m a d o r or the military government at the moment? But we see the diplomatic relationship; everything is going on. So I think, for us, whatever the side that we are taking, the government. But now I think we are still very amiable between Thailand and Burma. But during the British time, I think one of the thing that I always speak, I often speak that. I'm not trying to romanticize colonialism, but we cannot get away from it because this is how Burma was built upon. Because somewhere, somehow, it was under the British rule for more than half a century. There's no way that you cannot avoid talking about it. But during the British rule, of course, they've taken a lot of resources, but they've also built so many system in Burma: administrative system, also the education system. At one point, Rangoon University that you saw on the far left photo, it was ranked as one of the most um, good, the the most like in t e r m of academic merit in in Asia. Um, some of you might have heard or might have read about the Journal of Burma Research Society. So that was initiated at Rangoon University. So many um, renowned professor. Has visited Rangoon University to give lecture. They offer so much of liberal arts subject as well as the science subjects. So at that time, the education system in Myanmar was really well put in place. So you get a new breed of the young Myanmar people during the 50s, the 60s, who were very much hopeful. They were very educated. They engaged in a lot of white collar works, even the female. Who used to be only housewife or engaged in the kind of selling, attending the stores in the market, now there were there were more opportunity for Myanmar people, Myanmar lady, to have a white collar job as well. So the the, I think the, it was very hopeful at that time during the 60s, the the 50s and early 60s when when the country was enjoying the brief independence period. So all these photos were taken in Rangoon University. I'm just comparing the left ones to the right ones. Um, the graduation still take place at the convocation hall built during early 20th centuries by the British, and the Myanmar people still proudly wear their own traditional um, dress. And of course, they put out, they put on like the Western gown on top. But you can see right away that under that, they were still wearing long j e a n s So they still keep that traditions going on. But sadly, during the suppression of the military rules, I think somehow the students there were a thinker and they were quite rebellious against the military. So there were a big fight, and from time to time, the military have to force the, the university to close down temporarily during some periods. Or even in 1996, that General Kin Yun officially closed down Rangoon University for certain period, but now it's reopened. So I think during those period of of the military rule, um, the education system has been suppressed so much that somehow it 
if you meet um, Burmese people well educated in their 70s, 80s at the moment, they speak perfect English, they will readily engage in the discourse with you about different subjects, so academically, so in intellectually. But somehow that gap was missing during the suppression. And now I think, I don't know what's the outlook for the education system in Myanmar at the moment. There was a slight hope during that brief period of opening up in 2010, but now I don't know what's the future holds for them. And another photograph that I like, um, the left one was, that was in 1950s, when the monument, we call it Independence Monument. I'm sure when you visited Burma, you have seen the monument before. But the monument was built on the ground that used to call the Fitch Square. It was named after um, the Lieutenant General of Burma, Albert Squid, Albert Fitch. But before that, when Yangon wasn't a city like this, the land was just a swamp, all swamp with the muddy ground and flood every year. But then the British managed to clear out all the land and set up a very beautiful park, and they named it the Fitch Square. But then later on, post-independent, they renamed it again, called Mahabandula Garden. And that's where the independent monument was created. Um, this obelisk looking monument, um, if you look at it from the bird eye view from the sky, you will see that in fact, it was actually in the shape of five stars. So you have like fun, one big star in the middle and the other smaller star encircling the big star. It's like all the ethnic groups of Burma united in one. It was designed by the great local architect called Situ Utin. Situ Utin was a great architect. He was also the person who designed the city hall of Rangoon that you see nowadays. At the beginning, the city hall was built and there was a competition back in London to come up with the new design of the city hall. And in the, I think the, the design that won the competition was so Western that the local were not so pleased, so they, they veto that design and urge that the design has to come from the local, you know, homegrown architect, someone. And Situ Utin was the one who, who resubmit the new design with the kind of traditional um, finials and roofing. Now you see it's a kind of half. The, the, the bottom part was a Western building, but on top it was crowned with the Burmese roofing and some decorations of the Burmese mythical creatures and some brackets that is a Burmese design. So it was the same architect who designed this monument. And the uh, Mahat Bandula Garden has witnessed so many rallies, so many gatherings from the colonial time up until the recent time because it's so close to Sule Pagoda, which is equivalent to Victory Monument in Bangkok. So every time there's a rally, there's a gathering, or even in the Songkran Festival, New Year Festival, they hold a big countdown here. So it was a ground for all the activities, regardless of uh, political or non-political. And the other thing, the other issue that also fascinates um, outsider is the diversity of the ethnic groups in Myanmar. I think during the colonial time, they did some census for they use different parameters, spoken language, um, cultures, whatever things that they use, and they came up with a long list of more than 120 ethnic groups in Myanmar. But the recent census that was done in 2000 by the government of the military at that time, I think they already recorded about 40 something ethnic groups. So I guess some of them has gone over time when the language was not spoken, they were so, they were, acculturate by some other more dominant culture. So, but even now with only 40 something ethnic groups, they're still quite diverse in Myanmar. And I think the subject of um, ethnic diversity has been something that also fascinate outsider since the colonial time. Um, on the left photo you will see, that was the time when Prince of Wales visited um, Mandalay and Yangon in 1922. That Prince of Wales later, later became Edward VIII, who was the king for a brief period of time before he abdicated and married with Wallace Simpson from the US. So when he was a Prince of Wales, he did a grand tour of India, including Burma, and he visited 
Yangon, Mandalay. And this is in Mandalay. So one of the cultural um, extravagance that uh, the, ofi the officers in Mandalay organized for him was to have all the ethnic group coming and dress all in full ethnic dress, come out and parade around so he, he can see and enjoy the cultural diversity of Myanmar. So I think it was, an, it was a known um, characteristic of Burma since colonial time that is so diverse in ethnic and, and that diversity in ethnic group becomes more prominent when it comes into political issues, when it comes into autonomy of, I want to rule my own clans, when independence was gained. And if you look into Burma history, that in 1947, after Second World War, um, General Aung San signed what we call the Panglong Agreement with the leader of the Shan, the Xin, and the Kachin. And, it, in, and that agreement agrees that for a certain period of time, they would allow this major group of ethnic to govern their own people. But after the military took over in 1962, I think nothing in the agreement was, that was promised was acted upon. And I think from that, it became a kind of inflicted wound inside everyone in Myanmar. I mean, Either they are Bama or the ethnic minority, I think they, they hold that promise to their life and it, it, it becomes something that they felt that they were abused by this. And that's why now the ethnic people, they feel so much that somehow they were, I don't know, the vow was not kept as promised. And again, after 1962, they were suppressed more and more by the military government. Um, a lot of ethnic leaders were, were forbidden from, from, you know, to have their presence, to have their say and everything. And by being forbidden, sometimes suppressed, killed, kidnapped. A lot of Chan princesses were just taken away and you don't know where they are. You know? And you, you read about so many memoirs that all their descendants just wrote about whatever hardship they have to face. So I think that, that's why it's a very complex problem and sometimes we from outsider, even for me when I go to Myanmar and I was asked by the local to engage in the conversation about this, I have to be very careful because I don't know that I'm speaking from the viewpoint of outsider or I'm speaking from the viewpoint of someone who has studied the country for almost 20 years and seems to feel that I know so much. But when in fact there are so many layers into this and everyone there affected by this problem more or less from a different angle, from a different point of view. And not all the ethnic minorities in Myanmar love each other. Sometimes they hate each other as well. Outside, we might want to try to save Rohingya, but, I, but I've, I've heard a lot of locals say bad things about Rohingya as well. So for me, it's not to mention or to comment everything so deep because I don't know but I'm just pointing this, this out so you know that it's a long embedded issues that they have in the country and it's not so easy to untangle. And you can still see now that even the, the right photo is from the recent um, protest when the coup took place again in 2021 that um, the idea of uniting together from the ethnic um, homogeneity viewpoint is still putting out on display. So it means that this problem has never been solved. Um, just, I mentioned a little bit about the Shan um, royalties. Um, when the British took over the entire area of Burma in 1885, they demolished monarchy, they drove away the Burmese last king and queen to Ratnagiri in India. So the only remaining um, local elites in the local society was the Shan royalties. I think the British, they did spend a few years after 1885 of what they called the pacification period. They sent troops everywhere, try to pacify, try to announce to local that this is the new ruling power now. But I think Burma was so vast and somehow they know that over to the north eastern side or northern side the geography was so arduous that 
it's not easy for them to take control everything. So that's why they employ the same um, principle that they use in India of what they call divide and rule policies. So if you go to India, there are some, the Rajput, the Maharajas of different states, they were still allowed to have their own um, autonomy, but just submit themselves to the crown of the British monarch. So I think they also employ the same principle to Burma on a certain part where they cannot go and govern everything, which is the Shan state. So that's why at that time, the Shan royalty still remain in their own regality, their own autonomy of governing their own principality. But of course, the British would send the superintendent to go and help guide them into how they, they, in, they employ the policy of governing their own states. And every year, they are subjected to pay certain tax to the British crown. So I think the, the, the relationship was, was, was quite healthy. But you know, also, there were, there were a lot of conflict. But it's pretty healthy enough for that to continue until 1920s, 1930s. That at that time, I think the, the new generation Burmese people start to question about the future of Burma. Because at that time, Burma was separated out from India and become the new independent province. Whereas before, Burma was part of India. So, but in the photo that you see here on the left, that was the ruling prince of Sipo, which is about five, six hours drive from Mandalay. Sipo was in northern Shan state. It was one of the most um, prosperous states in northern Shan state because it lies in between the route from Mandalay all the way up to the Chinese border. And this prince here, he was educated in the Christian school. He also spent some time in London as well, so he was very progressive. And he was the grandfather of the last ruling prince of Sipo. The last ruling prince of Sipo, you know that prince well because he married to an Austrian wife who wrote the book Twilight over Burma. So this is the grandfather. But the picture, I chose the picture because the portrait was taken inside the summer palace that they built in 1920s. And that summer palace, you can see on the right photograph, it was a mix of Italian villa mixed with the Burmese inspired um, palace. So they have a very decent life, very fancy life. They would entertain the British people. They would have a five course dinner. They would employ like the Indian cooks and they were educated with the Western world. So they know the manners. In the evening after dinner, they would turn on the radio. At that time, they called it wireless and listening to what was going on in London. So it was quite fancy, the life that they had but everything was crushed after 1962. And the middle photograph was the palace that I, the photo I took myself. I, I know about the palace, but I couldn't locate it from the first time. So at one trip in 2018 or 17, I scout and I tried to find out what the palace is and I found this rune. You know, so so the, the Burmese part was collapsed and gone already. So now you see only the Western um, Italian pediment part that still remains. Um, later on, I think they clear off the wilderness. So it was in a good um, condition, but I don't know what it is now. And now back into Yangon. Um, I said the British, when they came, they... But before, believe it or not, when they, when they first conquered India, they didn't really care much about Burma at all because Burma was, such, was just another land that across the Bengal, the Gulf of Bengal, that they didn't really know much. It was only when the Burmese king started to fight with them over Arakan that somehow the British now wake up and that, oh, there was another vast land there. And the, the, the king, the Burmese king, fought with us over the Arakan. It inflicted the conflict from the beginning. And only after that, that the British paid more attention to Burma. But when the British took over everything already, not everything, in 1852, when the, after the Second Anglo-Burmese War, 
that when they conquered the lower part of Myanmar, they set up the capital in Rangoon. And the left photo was um, Strand Road. I learned as well that, you know, there are quite a few strand roads, not only in Burma, but elsewhere in the British colony. Or even in Burma, you get strand road in Maumeng as well, a road that run along the river with the big promenade, the center of the, the trades and commerce. They call it strand road as well. Or in, in Pateng or Besen at that time, there was a strand road as well. But this is a strand road in Rangoon. When Rangoon was established, it was merely just a swamp flat all the time. It was a fishing village that there's nothing fancy. So when they, when they built the city, they literally have to build an embankment on the, on the river and fill up with the dirt and so many things to just make it high so that it won't get flooded. And I think they, the British have a learning from Singapore. So they, they, they employ some high rank officer from Singapore I think his name was Montgomery. He came over and he gave advice on how to build Strand Road. And he said, you need to have at least 160 feet set back from the river to build the road wide enough to accommodate all the commercial activities. And from that road, when you build the grid line roads further into the city, each road needs to be 60 feet wide and it has to be 200 feet away from each block to another. So it was quite um, ambitious and, and, and they know what they were doing. That's, that's why we, we see a very nice town plan, very grid, a grid-like town plan um, in Yangon in Mandalay. And just to give a comparison of 100 years ago, this is probably in 1890s, taken by Philip Clears, who was a famous German photographer and the right one was Curran. Um, in the old photograph, the one in the forefront, in the foreground on the right, that was the um, telegraph office or the post office. And further up, you see a very high sphere that the Holy Trinity Church, but those buildings were all long gone. But on the right, the modern day, pretty much the same angle, all the colonial buildings were just torn down and rebuilt with the new one. But, but, but further up from the road, you still see a lot of you know, where the Strand Hotel is. That's, that's before this area. A lot of the building still remains intact, pretty much. But all those buildings that you saw, the Strand Hotel, the Port Authority, those are the buildings from 1910, 1920s. Because the original one that were built when Yangon was established from, 19, from 1860, 70, were all long gone and replaced by the, the newer generation than in the early 20th centuries. So Rangoon was very cosmopolitan. At one time during Rama the sixth period in Thailand, a lot of the elites here, they went shopping in Rangoon. I was very amazed to, to, to find out that fact from one of the records of the, the, the Thai elites. And speaking of how cosmopolitan Rangoon is, this is the photograph of the department store, the Ro and Co department store coming from British. Um, it was the, this is the new building that was built some, somewhere in 1910. It was the very first building in Rangoon that had the basement and the elevator. Ro and Co also have the branch in Momang in Mandalay. And they issue catalog four times a year. Each catalog is thicker than 300 pages. So they sell everything from whatever you can name, piano, chandelier, camping equipment, baby cradles, whatever you, whatever you want. You, know, you, can, you can place an order and they can ship it from England for you as well. So that's, that's how cosmopolitan Burma is. But this building was nationalized in 1962. The department store was looted badly during the Second World War, during the Japanese occupation. But then after the military took over in 1962, the building was nationalized and later on was leased to the Aya Bank who use it as a headquarter until now. This is one of the buildings that has been professionally renovated and still in a very good shape. I'm sure a lot of you have visited Rangoon before and you walk around in the different blocks so you see different degrees of um, 
renovation, tearing down, building the new one. <laughs> and there's also Yangon Heritage Trust that has been established by um, Saya um, Tan Min Woo, who was the author of the book, um, The River Lost Footstep, Where Burma Meets China. He established Yangon Heritage Trust, hoping to take care of the renovation, the propagation of the knowledge about how to manage all these cultural colonial relics in the city. But now, the future of the trust is also quite grim because I don't know what is going on at the moment. I think before the coup, they organized a lot of seminar, they organized a lot of walking tours, they do a lot of fundraising to try to help to preserve all these um, colonial buildings. Um, Burma became so big during the colonial time, partly because of the the economy that expands so fast because one of the things that the British was aiming for is to find the trade routes that connect between India to China. Um, I talk about Tan Min Wu that he wrote quite a few books. In the book Where Burma Meet China, on the, first, on the very first chapter he wrote that in the history of China, at one time, the emperor in Beijing or, or the capital of China was so amazed to learn that there is a passageway from deep far inland from China that connects to India because at that time they didn't know this passage. They just thought that further inland there was a lot of barbarian tribes living and nobody wants to travel there. And somewhere it surprised them to see that there were some goods from India that find their way up to Sichuan going into the Chinese capital. Before that, they only know that the only way to connect to India was by sea. So they go out to the east, come out to the sea, and engage in all those maritime trade to India. So I think the passageway from China to India is actually where Burma is. And I think the British realized that trade potential, immense trade potential, even before 1852, when there was still Upper Burma ruled by the king and Lower Burma ruled by the British, the British was trying to sneak in and to explore to that trade route, but the Burmese king was so, I think, careful. The king safeguarded that route so much that they didn't allow the British to travel upstream. Only after the, only after the, the Burmese king and the monarchy was um, abolished that when the trade route between um, the Gulf of Bengal all the way upstream to the border of China was fully explored. And since then, the trade was never stopped. The left photograph was the highest railroad trestle structure built in Asia. It was built in early 20th centuries, done by the Pennsylvania and Maryland Railway Construction Company. And imagine back then, all these structures were cast in the US, shipped from the US to Yangon. <laughs> and from Yangon, they put it all in the train, travel up to Mandalay to Maimyo, which is one book that I <laughs> brought for you today to sell. And from that, I don't know how they drag all these gigantic piece of metal all the way to this, to build this. So it's Gotek Viaduct. It still stands from the day it was built until now, still in use. I think at the highest point, it was about 100 feet above the ground. And the total length was about almost 700 meters. No, the height was 100 meters, sorry, 100 meters above the ground. And the length of the whole trestle was almost 700 meters long. So it was a mega structure gigantic done at that time. So it opens up the trade route. So everything from Chinese border was transported into Burma, vice versa, so quickly. Even up to now, the, sec the, the right photograph that was in the border checkpoint at the Muse. Muse was the town at the Sino-Burma border. Before I talk about the ruling prince of Sipo, Sipo was also part of this route so it's all connected. So everyone along the trade routes benefits from the trade so much. And up till now, you get a lot of trades, good trades, bad trades, a lot of human trafficking, of course, lots of drugs came in. 
Even now, I, I heard that in China now that the birth rate of India has surpassed theirs. And now in China, they kind of lack a female <laughs> from one child policy that they have employed for years. So there's something so unpleasant that they find their brides from Chan state and export the Chan lady to China to be the wife of the Chinese men. So that's something so unpleasant. On top of all these cheer, lucrative, um, <laughs> positive trade that is going on. And something is also similar. Burma has so much resources, um, not to mention teak wood, rice. At one point, Burma export teak wood more than Thailand and used to be number one like rice exporter from Southeast Asia. And I think they, they still do export a lot. And the other thing that people don't really realize is the gemstones. Um, if you have seen the movie Crazy Rich Asian, I'm sure some of you have seen, um, one of the character, the millionaire from Singapore, she bought, God, how many million dollar earring from one of the jewelers. And the jeweler would say, this is the pigeon blood ruby from Burma. And this is from this mine in Moko. Moko was um, northwestern from Mandalay, about five hours drive nowadays. But back then, it would take about five days horseback to go up there, about 4,000 feet above the sea level. So they have a lot of um, deposit on the bedrock level. It used to be an old river from the prehistoric time that somehow now leave them with a lot of you know, resources underground. So the mining of the precious stone has been going on since um, dynastic time up until colonial time. During the dynastic time, it's only the court that monopolized the, the rights to, to do the mining there. And the king also safeguard the mine so dearly. They, the king didn't allow the British to have access to this or even to visit. But then the British, when they took over, they readily set up the mine they put in the new mining equipments. But I'm comparing to you some photograph taken during the colonial time and some photograph took taking a few years ago. The activity was still the same. You still see people try to dig up the gravel from the ground, wash it with the water, so take away all the soil. So they were left with all small gravels where they will examine to find if it's ruby, some um, topaz, some tourmalines. And the photograph in the market where people, when they find all these rocks, they will bring it out to the market every day and try to offer. And you get people from everywhere to come in into Mogo trying to find the gem, to buy the gemstone, to make a fortune. Colonial writer described the market in Mogo more like a tower of Babel. You see, the British, you see the European, you see the Indians from the south, you see the Jetia, you see the Pante, which is the Yunnanese Muslim coming down from China, all trying to buy all these same, the precious stone from Mogo. So these are some photographs that, you know, I think and now the issue of resources is about something that Myanmar is still trying to sell, you get people with power trying to go in and exploit all these resources. So it's still the same stories, even from dynastic time up until colonial time or until now. And when the British took over Myanmar in 1885, um, the last ruling couple of Myanmar was put into exile in India in Ratnagiri. Ratnagiri was a very remote town on the East, on the western part of India. It's along the same coastline as Mumbai, but it was so remote that even when I begin studying about Burmese and histories and everything, I talk to my Indian friend, I said, I want to go to Ratnagiri. And they said, why do you want to go to that? Even the Indian didn't want to go to Ratnagiri. Why do you want to go? But you know, the story of the exile king and queen became more known to people in 2012 in Sudacha published her book called The King in Exile. But in fact, there was a British author that wrote about the book as well in 1950s already. But Suda took that book and do much more extensive research, more contemporary research on how the kings and queen descendants are doing at the moment and put together a very comprehensive book 
So I think if you if you love the history, I recommend you to read that book of Sudacha, and also the other book by Tan Nin U, where Burma meets China. That is a good book as well. So after that book came out, I think the story is about the ex king and queen of Burma become subject that people were so curious about, you know. And I think Suda has managed to track down all the dis remaining descendants that are still there. The couple, the royal couple, had four daughters. First daughter, um, allegedly, uh, married into the driver, the Indian caste, which is not so pleasant to her parents. And their descendants still live in Ratnakiri, but little that these people know about their great grandparents who were the kings and queen of Burma because it was so far distant and now they're still very poor in India. And you get another side of the family from the second, the third, the fourth daughters who married with the more um, noble Burmese people and now there are still a lot of their descendants in Myanmar. But these descendants, they, they, they have very vague memories about the kings and queens because when they, were grew, when they were growing up, they were already commoners. They didn't know what it was like in the court because even their grandmothers, who was the princess, didn't get a chance to live in the court in Mandalay because all of these daughters were born in Ratnakiri when they left in exile already. But somehow, I think the, the remains of the king were still buried in Ratnakiri. There was a talk of relocating the body to Myanmar but now I don't know what's the status of the negotiation. But ironically, the last emperor of Moku, the body was buried in Rangoon because he was exiled from India to live in Rangoon. So I think the British did the opposite for the India and the Burmese kings and the emperor. Uh, a little bit about the Thai and Burmese relation. I talk about the contemporary diplomatic relationship that uh, Thailand and Burma was trying to reconcile. But back in the old days, we know that um, two times that the Burmese sap a UTR. And nowadays, in the scholar world, they talk about the influence of the Siamese in the Burmese court only after the second sap of a UTR in 1767. But in fact, there were a lot of captive slaves from Ayutthaya that were forced to move to Myanmar during Bayinau or Burengnong King already when the first sap of Ayutthaya took place almost 200 years before 1767. Um, so in the court of Burma, everything Siamese was in high fashion. The music, the food, the theatrical performance, you get Ramayana version or Inau, which is the melodramatic um, epic that it was written during a UTR period, borrowing the story from the Javanese folklore. It was also adopted by the, the, the Burmese and played in the court. So the left photo was the court dancer, the most famous court dancer during King Mindong time. Her name is Yin Do Malay. So, um, if you are a Burmaphile, you know Sir James George Scott. He wrote so many books about Burma. And he said, every foreigner who go to Mandalay at that time, they will have to see Yindo Malay dancing because she was the diva at that time. And on the right, there was the contemporary reenactment of the Ramayana in Burmese version. So everything still continues. Now you can still see quite a few words in Burmese that has a Thai roots. If you know Thai, you know Khanom, Lot Chong, you know, Lot Chong. In Burmese, there was the, the exact same thing called Mong La Sound, which is Lot Chong. Or in Thai, there was a term Mahori, which referred to like the percussion band or the string ensemble band, Mahori. In Burmese, there's a term Matoti, which is the same spelling, but Burmese pronunciation. And this means the same thing. And some ceremonies that, I think the, I think the, the Burmese, they are so ingrained in all the ceremonies, everything that they do. The left photograph was the ear piercing ceremonies. 
um, for the boys, they will do the novitiation as a rite passage ceremonies, but for the girl, they will do the ear piercing ceremonies. So the ceremony is back then, almost 100 years ago, and the ceremony now is still pretty much the same. The girl would dress up in a kind of court-like costume, pretend to be a princess for a day to engage in the ceremonies. Whereas the boy would also dress as a prince during the novitiation ceremonies. And this costume has a root from the court regalia costumes. And you, if you see on the left, that's how the court costume was originally um, put together like. But of course, that photograph was a commoner already, so they took the tradition from the court. But the costume was so three-dimensional and have so many detachable pieces that somehow I don't know how they managed to sit or how they managed to move around. There are still quite a few examples kept at the v &A, but those were the real one from the court. I went to see the curator asking to see the real pieces, and the curator said, I can only bring the box out, open the box, and let you see. You cannot take it out, because every time I take it out, the sequence falls apart, and it's so big, and so, you know, it's, it's big, it, it's so heavy. The whole costume would weigh maybe more than 10 kilos when put together, especially for the kings and queen. If you've been to the National Museum in Yangon, you'll see two examples of the king and queen that were put on display. It was so heavily embroidered with the sequins, with the metallic threads, and the semi-precious stone. Um, my last few slides would talk about how engrind Burmese people to Buddhism. A lot of ceremonies that they do every year, every month, everything is still the same. Um, this is the photograph from the famous festival in Inlay Lake. Um, in Inlay Lake, you go to see the lake, and a lot of pilgrims go to visit one pagoda called Pang Do U Pagoda. In Pang Do U, there are five um, statues together as a group called Pang Do U, um, Buddha statues, five of them. And every year at the end of the land, they will have to take out five statues, not five, four only, take on into the boat like this and parade it all, parade it for 19 days into different villages on the lake shores so people can donate the money, can do the worshipping. And it's been like this for centuries and still continue till now. And I think the the energies in the air during the festival is pretty much the same. You get all the oarsmen, so many boats towing the main um, barge, which has the, pago has the statues inside. All these um, Inta and the Shan oarsmen, would, they would oars from sometimes using their legs, and the pivot point is quite high because on the, in the middle of the, of, the, of the boat, they will set up a rail and that's where they put the, <laughs> the paddle, and that's the pivot point where they do the rolling. So it's quite different from how we do the, <laughs> the, the rolling in the Western world. And the other extravagant that relates to Buddhism in Myanmar is the funeral of the revered monks. Um, when the revered monk die, in the old days, I think now they still do, is that they embalm the body. But now I don't think they do the embalming like in the old days. They just inject some formalins and then the body will stay. But in the old days, they, they pretty much like almost mummify the body. They've taken out the inner parts, they inject, they, they, they stuff in the ashes and everything inside the cavity just to, to absorb all the liquids and they put the honey, they put the lacquer on the, the body, and they've kept it for a year or so. And during the waiting time, there'll be people from around in the different town coming to pay respect, and they gather the funding in order to set up a very elaborate um, funeral like this. They would build the kind of funeral, the crematorium, so huge. If you look at the upper left, um, corner photo, you'll see the scale of the crematorium as compared to the people taking photograph on the ground. And they will build, to me, I told my friend, this is like a Walt Disney castle. <laughs> I jokingly tell them, it looks so much like Walt Disney castle. 
but all of this will be burned along with the with the body when the auspicious day come so it was a it was actually a a celebration in in Burmese language the funeral of the revered monk they call pong chi pian pian is actually to go back so when the revered monk die he's not actually die and reborn again because he's already going to the nirvana so it's basically send, sending his soul back to the heaven. So that's why it's called like the Pong Chi Pian. It's like sending back the, the monk. And this, during these activities, there's not much of mourning, but it's more of the temple festival. You get the, the performances every day. You get a fairground with people coming to open the stalls. People come to shopping, pay respect to the dead body as well. So it's a big fair of the village or the town that have and you can still see the same tradition being reenacted everywhere in Myanmar. Or even other things that, um, in Myanmar, you have to see that the idea of power, political power and religion is tied so closely to one another. When you hold political, political power in your hand, at the same time, you need to announce that you are also the protector of the faith, which is in Burma, is Buddhism. And it has been like this throughout the histories. Um, on the left photo, that was the tiered roof made from brass, elaborately doing the piercing work into the mythical um, creatures and some of the donation, big parade. So that is done when they want to donate the new tiered umbrella to the pagoda, either to replace the old one or when the new pagoda was built. So especially for the Chwe De Gong, the most revered pagoda in Burma, it was the point in every reign of the ruling monarch that they have to do something to renovate, to enlarge everything about the pagoda. So during the British um, when the British came already, King Mindong, the last, the one before last king, he was trying to donate the Tia umbrella to Shui De Gong Pagoda in 1871. But at that time, Lower Burma was already under the British. The British didn't allow him to do so because the British know this, that if you allow the Burmese king to still come, make a great merit, on the territory of the British crown, it signifies to the local that the Burmese king is still ruling over Lower Burma. So in the end, the British administration didn't allow King Mindong to come down, but they allowed the king to send the tier roof and they designate the local, um, the local um, respected elders to be the chair in the, in the hoisting of the tier roof ceremony. But the ceremony was talk of the town. I think they did maybe two, three weeks celebration and each day it was attended by thousands of people. But I think the ploy is still the same. Even nowadays you still see the military general engage themselves in all these big merit making ceremonies. On the right side, the bottom photograph, that's um, General Min Ong Lai. He was still performing the ceremonies, so hoisting the tear umbrella to the top of the pagoda, you know, um, doing the ceremony with this and that when the big pagoda or big Buddha images were donated. So somehow it signifies that political power, religious power is still hold under the same ruler. And this is the way it is from the old days up until now. And now if you go into Myanmar, you will see that the clergy is also one of the big supporter of the general. And the general always make it a point to try to bring in the famous Sayado or the big revered monk into their side. So that is kind of binding all the two powers together. Um, last one, this is also the donation of the um, marble Buddha image. The left one was King Mindong. It was more than nine feet tall, several hundred tons. King Mindong, when he wanted to dethrone his brother, because his brother was the one who failed to fight with the British during the Second Anglo-Burmese War. 
So when he dethroned his brother, he made a wish that if I can dethrone my brother and become the king, he would make a big donation of the large, humongous marble Buddha image. And that was the one that he donated. And that big piece of rock, it was curie from somewhere 30 miles away from Mandalay, brought down on the river. I don't know how they do it. it <laughs> I, I heard that first they curie the big rock, then they dig the big hole on the ground. So the rock fall into the hole. And then they dig the canal from the river. So during the rainy season, let the water flow into the canal, coming into the big pit that they dug with the big rock. So they, they somehow they managed to float the rock and push it into the river, where they wrap it up and towed it to Mandalay, and reverse the same thing and take it into the present site. And at that time, it took another two years to finish the whole Buddha image. And this Buddha image still stand at the base of the Mandalay Hill. So somehow, I think religious faith, building gigantic religious effigy, is tied into the history of, of how power, political power was interplay in, in, in Burmese histories. But on the right side, the industry of making Babu Buddha image still carry on in Mandalay. And Mandalay is still a renowned city where a lot of religious paraphernalia was produced. Even now, when you want to set up a new monastery in Myanmar, everything will have to be purchased from Mandalay because it's the original city where all of these crafts were made. The craftsmen were there, and the quality was at the top notch. So this is all I have prepared for tonight. So I hope I haven't bombarded you with so much information. But I think this would give you some ideas of, of how this country is all about. And it's been like this for centuries. Yes. So thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. That was a, a fantastic talk. And I've actually heard a couple of AX talks. And I think that was actually the best I've, I've ever heard. And the, and the lengths you've gone to to juxtapose the contemporary with the old photos. I haven't seen that before. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you. And does bring to mind the, um, you must have watched the ceremony to inaugurate that grotesque marble Buddha statue last Monday, yes. uh, which was the uh, Min Ong Line's dream to have the biggest Buddha statue in, is it Southeast Asia or in Asia? It's, it's huge, but I don't think it's as big as the Kamakura Buddha maybe. Or, uh, I think it's, I think they've, they've had bigger than that, but this one may be the biggest that, that has ever done by the military or something because they try to replicate so many things. Like even in Naypyidaw, which is the new capital that was established by the military, they built another Shwedagong there to signify that this is the legitimate new capital of Burma, of right. Myanmar. Yeah. Yes. Very interesting. I wonder if all, all the marble came from Mandalay for that one as That's, well. Uh, the town is called Sajin, which is 30 mm -hmm. miles from Mandalay. Right. It's a big area where they curry all the marbles. Wow, yes. hard work. Yes. Uh, now, uh, <laughs> we're going to, people are welcome to ask questions, but I'm just going to take a bit of a moderator's prerogative here and say that I know that that iconic photo on the cover, so you've gone into it in the book and you have mentioned it before, but I. I wonder if some of the audience might like to know as well. There's this very enigmatic, beautiful-looking uh, princess on the on the cover. Oh. Um, d you don't have the image, do you? In the uh, I couldn't. Go I think it's on the on the front of the of yeah. the presentation. But she was the wife of a high rank um, officer in Mandalay at that time. It was taken on her wedding day in 1910. But I. There was, a, there was a description behind the photograph, her, the writing behind the photograph, so I know who she was. So not so much that I can identify the real identity, especially the local who pose for the photographs. Because in the early days when the photograph came into Burma, um, the clientels were Westerners, and a lot of photographs with local people were just meant for the Western consumption. 
sometimes local people will just hire to pose as a model, mm. whereas the model may never have seen their own portrait for mm. the rest of their lives. And they, they may be complete nobodies and you can't identify who they were, yes, but they but look royal or they yeah, look glamorous. But, or yes, they look but later on, when the local were pretty much have disposable income, so they became the patrons of the craft themselves as well. So this is one of the early photographs that the local became the patrons of the craft right. on her wedding day. So I realized when, uh, I think, uh, my publication, we ran a uh, very good article about the book, but when we were going through the photos, I realized it, it must have been a nightmare because half of them you don't know who took them or what date they were, let alone who's in them, right? Yes. So what um, proportion of, of the photos you've got in the book were like that, that you have no idea who took it or when? I think more than half that I did not know who took them because it was from the amateur cameras. But from the date, I can pretty much decipher from the dressing style or maybe the monument that I saw in the photograph or some some, some, clue. some cues some in clue, the photograph yeah. that tell, maybe I cannot tell exactly which year, but I can say that, oh, this is from the 20s or the 30s. Oh. This is before 1900 for sure. Something that, that I can tell. And is there any technology now that gives you a more precise dating process in sort of very old photos? You can't run them through some machine no. that says <laughs> it well, was taken in. No, I think carbon dating only work when you have something thousand years, years old. old. Right. But if something is only 100 years old. Right. Well, you know, I thought Google had come up with something where you could sort of say, oh, this was taken on the 4th of February, uh, 1834 or something. But I, but I think you need to, to kind of see a lot. Then you start to make comparisons. And when you make comparisons, you start to see some photographs that were taken on the same or pretty much similar spot. And you see the progression of, oh, in this building, in this picture, those buildings were not there yet. But in this, in this photograph, you see this already. Right. So it's I mean, like detective work. Yes. <laughs> but this is, this is what I, I do. I'm, as, a, as a buyer of photograph books myself, I often get dissatisfied with a very short caption that I pretty much don't know what is there in the photograph. So when I do my own, I make it a point that I need long caption. Mm. So that people Which is why the book is so <laughs> great, by the way. If you like explanation of the images, I think you've done it incredibly well. Yes, there's a lot of stories that I told you today is pretty much part of the research that I try to read the photographs. You know. yes. mm. So um, for anyone who wants to ask questions, the microphone's up there, or it's a small group, so if you don't want to use the mic, I guess we can try alternative methods. Um, yes. Um, um, can you speak as loudly as you can? <laughs> okay. uh, why would, um, Just identify why yourself. Why yeah. themselves with the military hunter when it's clear that the population is not happy? Why would they risk that? I think um, even before the coup or even during the colonial time, in Burma, Buddhism is so strong and a lot of people are very devout. So that somehow accumulate the power of the clergy. The ecclesiastical system is very strong. So more or less, when the monk is highly revered, he's more like an influencer who can just tell people what to do, what to believe. And especially when people respect that monk a lot, so this is not a new thing. Even during 1930s, 19, 1920s, 1930s, when there was a nationalist movement, part of the active participant was the monks. And in Myanmar, you have to say that, um, I get these questions as well, just in my last trip in Mandalay, my Burmese friend said, I like how the monk, um, <laughs> uh, in Thailand that they are so reserved, whereas the monk in Myanmar, they are so outgoing, doing so many things. But what I learned from what I researched is that in Myanmar, the way the monk um, embraced Buddhism or practiced Buddhism, the focus is more on the 
studying of the doctrine rather, rather than putting more focus on the restriction and regulation, which is called the Vinaya from the Tepitaka. The they focus more on Apitama, which is the doctrine, the study of the doctrine. That's why they are not so strict in terms of you know, eating at night time. Sometimes you see the monk driving. So I think in terms of the way the monk can behave, it's much more relaxed in Myanmar than Thailand. Mm. And I think that's why it is the reason why the monk can engage in political activities easily. I'm not sure if I answer your question, but, but well, but no, I guess the question was more like why would they? But I think that's only a, a, a portion of them. Some monks have been quite radical and progressive, yes. but there is a solid core of prominent monks who are aligning themselves with yes. the military. And you have to know that in Myanmar, a lot of the rich military are the big donor as well. So I, I mean, it, it's a lot of power games going on. You mean the military? No, or she the means the monks. Like oh, the, we're, we're gonna no. impact Buddhism and the I think, local beliefs I when think they see. This is happening around the world that the new generation, especially the young one, they don't want to attach themselves with any faith anymore. If you talk to people in their teen or early twenties, what faith do you hold? What religious do you are are you? They said I'm non religion. Have you heard about the kind of needs that in the form now on the religious checkbox? There have to be another checkbox, no religion. <laughs> it happens not only in Western world, but in Myanmar as well. Does that option exist on forms in Myanmar? <laughs> I don't think so, not yet. <laughs> but I think now, I think more and more, even in Thailand, a lot of young generations now, the level of attachment to Buddhism as compared to my generation, my parents' generation, it kind of wore down mm. as well. Mm. Yeah. Is that what you see when you go there these days? Yeah. Yes. yes. Interesting. But, you, but, but I think the faith is still very strong collectively in the nation. Of course, you get people who are not happy when they heard the monks commenting upon politics or doing some activities with the general, but somehow it's still some conflicting things in their own faith because they respect that monks a lot, but how come the monk do this? It's, it's a struggle, not only mm. on the appear something that is so obvious that you see, but also inside their own mind, you know, mm. for a lot of locals. Mm. Interesting. Yes. Uh, okay, so I would like to know, you've been asked this lots <laughs> of times, right, which is what's your favorite photo or photos in the book and you've often replied you know it's very hard to pick well, but i would also can i add a separate question which is related but not necessarily the same which is what photo or photos are you most that most thrilled you that were the most difficult to get or the most exciting to discover that might not necessarily be your favorite well, so what are you most proud of in that book there? Okay. Um, what I enjoy a lot are the photos that were taken by amateur photographers, something candid, something impromptu. And those I found quite a lot from 1920 onwards when portable camera and film, rolls of films, Kodak development was so widespread. So you get a kind of setting that is so natural. Mm -hmm. And somehow when I find the old album, you can pretty much curate a lot of stories by seeing the progression of how the owner of album took photograph, the way they arranged it, the little note that they wrote in the old albums. Mm -hmm. As compared to the earlier version that were taken by the professional photograph that was so choreographed, you don't know who the people are, it was all in the studios, and some, some of them were not even real, but somehow <laughs> has been put into a fancier setup in order to impress the Western <laughs> clients who buy the photograph from the studios. But the most valuable things that I have come across, there was a few photographs that I put in the book as well of the Burmese um, diplomat who went into Europe during late 1900s, late 19th centuries. And it was taken while they were in Italy. So that 
I was very fortunate to come across them. And I think they surfaced in Europe because it was taken and gifted to the diplomatic people in Europe at that time when Burmese diplomats were traveling around in Europe. So it came out from the old collection somewhere, somehow, and then I stumbled into it. And the uh, antique books dealer that found it didn't know what they were, so they thought that, oh, it was Asian men in uniform, in costume. But I knew when I saw it that it was Burmese diplomats. <laughs> so you were excited about yes. that, yeah. Yes. And yes. have the, um, you know, because you've been going around and you, you buy photos, all over the place and I guess some are really cheap because people don't realise what they've got or they're just in a dusty box in the back yes. of a bookstore or else dealers who really know what they've got. So is there a kind of, um, you know, joy of discovering something that's really special for, at, you know, for sort of sixpence or something? Well, I think it's, I, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't pay a lot for a lot of photographs that I collect because sometimes they just has been cleared out from home, you know, when, when someone die, people don't really care of the old stuff anymore. But for me, like, like the photograph that I show, like, like this book, like these tools, you know, of the ladies, you know, graduation or in Yangon University, I just found them on the street in front of Scott Market. And I probably pay I don't know, maybe a tenth of one dollar for each, I don't know. And it, it, but these were small, they were just only about less than, smaller than my palm. And sometimes some of them came with termite dust, half torn, maybe half damaged from the moist because they were not kept in good condition. And you'd still buy? If the subject is interesting, why not? You know, mm -hmm. you know if they were interesting, like, like the photo on the left, this talk, I use it to, to illustrate, you know, the education system in Myanmar. But on the other talk, I use that photo to illustrate about the, the skirt she was wearing. <laughs> so, so, so I took every bit from the photograph of what I can, I can learn and understand. Multi-purpose. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, something else I'd like to ask before we uh, wrap up uh, is... Um, your next projects, Ake, you, you have such a wide range of interests and as I mentioned, textiles as well as um, photos and also uh, Thai as well, Thai, uh, not so much? Or? Not so much, Chan, Burmese, yes. So what are your next projects? In fact, I was intending to do the book on Burmese textiles even before the project of these photo oh, books. So you were completely sidetracked into this? Yes, but then I, I studied textiles and then I got into collecting photographs because I want to find reference to the, the costume they're wearing, the apparel they were wearing, and then it got into different things, photograph as well. And then I think people love it when I post a photograph on social media and I try to, to, talk, to describe what it is in photograph that I see. And thanks to River Books, to the publisher, Narissa Chakapong, who saw the value in this. And she said, why don't you do the photograph book before the textile book? She was keen on the textile book as well. But she said, why don't you do photograph books first? And that's why I got sidetracked into this photograph book projects. Like how many years? Uh, it didn't take me long to actually write the captions because somewhere, somehow, I read, it, it came through from, from my research already about all these bits and pieces of information. But the, the thing that took time most is to try to remember what bit of information from what book that I read, because if you read the book, you will see that I give the footnotes on the source of certain part of the information that I took from because sometimes it's all in my head, but I couldn't remember from which book that I read about this. So that's the bit that took more time. Mm, tracking it down. Yes, yes. So now you're going back to the textile book. Is so that your new project? Hopefully, because you know I've, I've been doing some few research, visiting a lot of the weaving house, visiting the old master weavers. One of them has died already since I interviewed her. And I promised those aunties that I need to, to write the book on textiles and add in their stories into it. You owe it to them. I know. <laughs> yes. 
So that'll be done soon? Uh, hopefully in the next three years, I hope. <laughs> yes. you, you wouldn't hold that against me if three years and the book didn't come out yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just want to make sure they're still alive, I suppose. Yes, yes. Um, is there anything else, any point you'd like to make? Oh, I, I mean, this photo book project, you know, it conceived before the coup took place. And after the coup, after the pandemic, it was held back a little bit because at that time, the publisher and I were hesitant about to launch it or not to launch it because of the situation in Myanmar. But after a few years passed, and we, we hope that we don't know really what future holds for Burma. But we just thought that this is a good reminder of how big they used to be, how glorious their history is, and they should not lose hope. And especially with a lot of suppression during the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and a few short of breath of 10 years during 2010 to 2020, and now back to that suppression again. A lot of histories, a lot of memories were gone from the, from the younger generation. So I hope that this book would give them hope, mm. tell them what their history used to be like, and will inspire them. Mm. Actually, for, for whatever future holds, you know. That's a yes. very inspiring uh, yes. thought. Uh, actually, to riff off that, and I am reminded, yes. I meant to ask you that one, one sort of big bit I, that sort of is a gap there is uh, in your selections is really any of the hint of the wars and the violence in the culture and, uh, for example, the particularly the, uh, not just the Anglo-Burmese wars, but I mean later on, you know, the suppression of ethnic right. groups and Karen and... Right. Well, I, I stopped my journey at 1962 because that's when the Navy took over mm. and everything started to go down the drain after 1962. Mm. So I stopped at that point. So that's why I didn't really <laughs> have the later photograph with a lot of violence. Mm, no, I guess I meant around uh, world, the the world, world War, war and right. like, you know, the Karen uh, rebellion and uh, all that. But that's getting to the end of when you cut off. Right? Yes. I found, I found some photographs, but they were most in the local publication, like in an old magazine. But then it wasn't in good quality enough to publish. Right. Yeah. You know? And some of them has a lot of, you know, bomb, you know, that destruct the whole cities and everything. And to me, it's not so nice, you know, all those photographs. Right. Yeah, it doesn't say a whole lot about cultural yes. or uh, other aspects yes. apart from historical yes. aspects. And during the Japanese occupation, I think, I have a few photographs in the book, I didn't show here, but it, it talks about those, the war time, something during the Japanese occupation mm. there as well, mm. yes. Right, fascinating. Yes. Well, unless there's any other questions, I'd. I'd really like to thank you, uh, Aik, and also River Books, uh, Narissa Chakapong, who's had the vision to publish this as well. But she's very lucky she had a great, you know, a great writer and uh, thank you. scholar in you. Thank you. So thank you, you as well, Gwen, for the opportunity. I mean, it's great to be here and to share. And I hope I don't bore you for some of you who have listened to the talk already. Well, I think time. they're all still sitting here, so <laughs> I don't think you bored them too much. <laughs> Any complaints can be directed to the speaker. Um, and thank you all for coming, and do look at our programs on the website or Facebook page. Um, oh, yes. Oh, oh, there's a, yeah, it's um, the book club, it's another book talk. We're trying to do fairly semi-regular book talks and it's a, a rising young star author, Thai, uh, Ping Wang Wante, Te Chawat. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, her debut novel, The Moon Represents My Heart, in English, and uh, she's had a lot of attention for that. So she'll be speaking. But I think you can see all the details on the website. So, um, so keep an eye on the programs. Do come. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm still around a little bit. If you have any questions, yes, I'm happy oh, to. Oh, yeah, or if you want to buy a copy, he's still here to sign it. <laughs>